um, a bit of a bit of housekeeping. Um, if you'll recall, the format for these conversations is that normally um, the conversation is an hour and 15 minutes. So we conclude at a uh, quarter past the hour. Um, the first 45 minutes we will uh, record and then thereafter into a kind of more open session because people tend to feel more comfortable um, when they know that they aren't being recorded so they can really kind of chat. Um, and then of course, if you wish to stay for the uh, water cooler chat um, afterwards, we continue even after the official time is over, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, yeah, so today it gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend, Gemma Khan. Um, Gemma is a noted South African performance artist and theater maker based in Cape Town. She has performed a unique style of visual theater, both nationally and abroad including residencies in Holland, Cape Town, and the Venice Biennale in 2015. Her writing credits include the theatre productions Cellist with Rabies and The Borough Pit, the latter of which was a production as the Standard Bank Young Artists for Theatre, um, which award she received in 2018. Gemma's video works are available to see online, and they've been exhibited in Johannesburg, Cape Town, Glasgow, and as part of the inaugural Virtual National Arts Festival in 2020, and that's the South African National Arts Festival, that is. Um, and the title of today's conversation is Naughty Stories for Consenting Adults, Making and Having Fun in Deadly Serious Time. And the broad kind of rubric right, that, that we were hoping to kind of speak through was this, this um, question around how humor can be used as a tool to attract, connect with, and sustain audiences who generally wouldn't be drawn to the theater. Um, and it's going to be quite a wide range of discussion. Um, we will be talking about Gemma's approach to making theatre for, about, and of our time, and using her experience as an independent artist who works across disciplines um, to make to think about um, aesthetic possibilities and challenges presented by the need to invent new ways of making and presenting live theatre now. Um, we will also look at questions of intimacy and liveness in kind of this intermediate form of storytelling. Um, Gemma, Gemma Khan. Um, Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, we decided that today we're going to start in a somewhat unusual way. Um, instead of describing uh, the kind of mode of work that Gemma works, and we thought it'd be fun to show a small piece um, from her collection of Kamishi Bai works. Um, Gemma, could you tell us about where Ikido on the Carp? That's from. Uh, uh, Sorry, the name just Epstein went. Epstein Butcher. Epstein Butcher, right. So it's, it's one of the stories from Epstein Butcher, um, which you'll hear more about uh, in the conversation. But do you want to go ahead and, and treat us and then we'll move on from there? Sure. Thank you. Just uh, yeah, put your hands up if the sound isn't great or if you can't see. Aikido and the Carp. Once upon a time, long, long ago, on the steeps of a distant mountain, a hundred miles from anywhere, in a little ramshackle hut, there lived a Zen master by the name of Mokurai. Now, Mokurai was known throughout the land for his wisdom, his corpulence, his wit, but not for his patience. Now, one fine day, Mokurai was just settling down to his lunch when he heard the distant rasping breath of a visitor straining up the steep slope that led to his hut. Moments later, the visitor appeared in his doorway, bowed deeply and introduced himself. My name is Aikido, and I have walked a hundred miles to seek your, your wisdom, great master. The Zen master sighed, looking dolefully at the delicious carp that was now cooling on his plate, and then up at the quiet desperation in his visitor's eyes. Mokurai cleared his throat and bade his visitor speak. Aikido explained. All my life, 
I have tried to walk the noble eightfold path. Since I was but a child, I have meditated eight hours a day. When I was 21, I fasted for 60 days at the spirit rock cave of Regando. Yes, I, I've memorized all the sutras of the Taisho Shinshu Daizo Kyo, and for seven years, ending only on this very day, I have observed a vow of silence. And yet I, I find myself no more enlightened than I was as a child. I do not understand, master, nothing makes any sense. What is the meaning of it all? Mukurai sighed deeply, and setting aside his fish, he said, <sighs> Yes, well, I, I can answer your question with a story, okay? And so he began. Once upon a time, long, long ago, on the steeps of a distant mountain, a hundred miles from anywhere, in a muddy pond, there lived a carp. Yes. Now, he was restless in mind and spirit, always questioning, never satisfied. Why do bubbles float, he said, but stones sink? Why is it light and then dark? And then light again. Why am I sometimes happy and sometimes sad? What is the meaning of my life? Until one day, oh no, no, there was a plop. <laughs> a big juicy worm appeared. And for an instant, the carp's questions fell away as he contemplated this delectable morsel before him. Without thinking, he gobbled up the worm, and suddenly a hook pierced his cheek, and his mouth filled with the taste of his own blood. Twisting and turning through the water, he swam back and forth, back and forth, every muscle taut against the line, until finally the fight had gone from him, and the carp shot out through the air, up, up into the sky. He had been hooked by a fisherman. A very tall and handsome fisherman, if I might add, but it, it, it's not important. Anyway, this very tall and handsome fisherman grabbed the carp by the tail and slammed him against a stone until he was quite dead. Da boom, da boom. And then he lit a fire by the side of the river and cooked the carp in light broth with some bonita flakes and a little kombu seaweed. Hmm. The end. Yeah. Master, I I seem to have got the wrong slide. There we go. Master. I, I do not understand your story, forgive me, but it seems to make no sense. Yes, said Mokurai, and such is life. Now, will you fuck off, please, while I eat my lunch? Thank you. As he walked the hundred miles back to somewhere, Ikido pondered the Zen master's words. Who was the fish? What was the fish, the pond? Did the worm represent the, the craving of the spirit? Did the hook represent suffering? Or the sweet release of death. And in his little ramshackle hut on the steeps of a distant mountain, a hundred miles from anywhere, Mokurai burped. For him, it had been a lovely afternoon. <sighs> Bravo. Thanks so much, Gemma. It's my pleasure. <laughs> so here's the thing. I, I absolutely recognize that perhaps my, my deep and, and sometimes annoying fascination with the story form is because I, I, I find it personally so fulfilling. I 
derive a lot of pleasure from watching this very simple story form work that maybe other people don't. But that's where I am and that's what you're going to have to deal with today. Um, can you tell us a little about how you arrived here, um, both at the form and how you discovered Kanishibai and, and so forth? Yeah, um, I, I lived in Japan for two years doing the English teaching jet course. Uh, and I stayed in a little town about two hours train ride from Hiroshima, where the town's major industry was the building of ship's windows, which was quite a dour industrial town. But um, on a trip to the Manga Museum in Kyoto, I saw a performer doing Kamishibai, and I'd never seen it before. The Manga Museum's in a, a, a repurposed primary school so there are these little wooden chairs and at some point we were told to come and watch a performance and we sat on these little wooden chairs and a man who it turns out was a bunraku puppeteer and a kamishibai performer on the side performed this thing and it just knocked my socks off mm. <laughs> i loved it so much so i went back to my little town and my one and only friend who was a part-time english teacher part-time farmer whose nickname was Gunch. I said to him, Gunch, I've seen this thing, this amazing thing. And he said, yeah, yeah, there's a performer in our town. You should meet him. So the performer rocks up uh, the following week. Uh, his English was non-existent. My Japanese was not good. His dialect was very thick. So together we kind of tried to work things out, but he brought boxes and boxes of stories that he has been performing for 30 years, 40 years in the traditional way, which is that you have a bicycle or some kind of mobility with your box on the back and you ride around to uh, little towns and bash your hashi together, your sticks, and then uh, all the children from the village come to and they sit and you can watch the show for free, but if you sit in the front row, you get sweets. Um, <laughs> and we perform together he said to me, would I write a story about the bombing of Hiroshima that we can perform on Memorial Day in front of the bomb dome? Which was an enormous amount of pressure. Um, but what I learned from him was not to be precious at all. So I kind of, you know, like worked out how to tell this story to the people to whom the story belongs and, and tied myself up in knots. And he took one look at my illustrations and he was like, no, more neon. <laughs> yeah so then we would perform together and go on these sort of three-day trips mostly I would watch him perform because when we performed together we would do it bilingually which really slowed the, the 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 process down but I watched him and I learned um the size of a narrative performance and then just this uh, amazing um magnetism of this little wooden television that has been mm. around since the 12th century in some or other iteration. And then I came back to South Africa uh, and made a show, which was an homage to Japan in some ways, but it was also a way for me to fight my demons, which I had in Japan to a huge extent. Um, and no one in South Africa had seen it before. So the show was very successful and off mm. we went. And that was Epicene, right? It was uh, Epicene Butcher and other stories for consenting adults. Which adults. Is, uh, uh, what what I was playing on on the title for this talk. Yes. But, um, yeah. So Kamishibai is traditionally a, a, a medium for children, and you can see why. Um, it's 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 such a beautiful transformation of when you read a story to a child or to a group of children. You read and then you turn the book around and show them the pictures. This is simply. Um, a streamlining of that because all the words are on the back. <laughs> mm. <laughs> the whole is back the box and, uh, and that's where the words are. Yeah. But oh yes, yeah, so I, I made the story for adults just because I've never wanted to make theatre that isn't slightly perverse. Yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> So I guess that's that's the interesting thing here, right? Is 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 this this beautiful tension between the form itself is, is so obviously kind of invested in a kind of wondrous, childlike, irreverent kind of mode, right? It's, it, 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 I like that you used um, like this little wooden television box where you're kind of manually proceeding through the images. So there's that kind of thing happening. And then you've got these, these stories or, or the scenarios into which you are now moving 
losing and working through Kamishibayan, which is not the kind of conventional space necessarily where, where one might have encountered the form. I'm really interested then in, in, in for you, what, what the, the use of this form or this mode to begin addressing slightly more mature audiences or working with slightly more mature subject matter allowed for you in a way perhaps that might not have been possible or effective in a more conventional kind of theatrical staging of those stories. Yeah. Well, I mean, the the first, the, the, the making of Epicene Butcher the, the night before we opened the National Arts Festival, the director mm. said to the writer, this is not gonna work. Shame, but she's worked so hard. <laughs> Let's just <laughs> let her have her, her little time to shine. Um, and yet it did. And that came as a surprise to us all. I think that the box functions, firstly, that the, I think the short story is a really uh, appropriate medium for horrible stories or like that, mm. that, that you, can, you can handle a, a radical piece of content if it's five minutes or 10 minutes. And, and the shows that I did initially had like seven stories that gave you a little flavor of all sorts of things. Um, so I think, I think you can go a lot further if you do it in a short amount of time. And then that the, the, the box functions as a mask between the audience and the performer, giving a kind of like safety barrier, like a condom <laughs> to <laughs> everyone. Because, because the, the contract that you enter into in the first place is this is not real. Mm. you know which of course we know going to the theater but sometimes we are asked to suspend that and here you aren't mm. You, mm. this isn't real and then you mm. can go you know you can get stuff that might be uh incredibly upsetting if it were to deal with the actual human body you can do in the box you can mm. also yeah, so you can be very violent you can be very sexual and also completely um bizarre mm. uh a and you can get there quickly so mm. I think that how the medium works also depending on, so these illustrations that I just did now were, were by an artist, Carlos Amato, his work is very beautiful, but a lot of the illustrations I do myself and they're quite naive. And I think that adds another layer of protection and um, night, yeah, and, and silliness that can, can be a good uh, facilitator of horrible stories. Yeah, so I think you've, you've much more clearly <laughs> named perhaps what, what I was trying to reach to before, which is the sense that the way that this mode functions between the box and your proximity to it and this kind of frame that's created for us um, is very intimate. But I mean, I, I love this idea that the, that the box functions as, as um, a mask, right? Is that all of this draws us in, but it's also a way of kind of producing some kind of distance as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that the kind of story is compelling, it draws us in, but not in a way that feels, for want of a better word, because I hate this word, unsafe, right? Um, yeah, there's, there's and, a, and, and, hmm. and when we discussed this before, I used that word a lot too. And it's funny because I wouldn't think of myself as a modely, a molly coddler or a, hmm. you know, or, or someone who treats the audience with kid gloves. But having performed this stuff so many times and learned how audiences function, um, mm. you're not gonna get anywhere without a safety net of some kind. And, you, mm. and, and the audience needs to be coaxed or tended to, even if they're unaware of it, so that you can really get into nasty stuff, but you've, but you've uh, gotten there slowly. I think mm. Mm. yeah yeah and 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 then you know in, in in at another level of the same kind of you know dynamic that's at work it's it's there's something to me about the illustration <laughs> that that opens up a whole lot of um i guess imaginative possibilities mm. that a kind of live in-person bodily staging perhaps doesn't allow. Now, having said that, um, <laughs> we're on the same page. Uh, so uh, Gemma has, I mean, obviously Epicene Butcher and um, other stories for concerting adults was built in this kind of more classic framework with just the box and then Gemma, plus another performer on stage um, called Chalk Boy or Chalk Girl. But then the, you took the form and you kind of, you know, 
let it grow in, in various different ways and began experimenting with it. And I'm really interested in, in thinking a little more about what happened when you, for example, introduced more performers into the space and you didn't have this mm. one-on-one kind of intimate storytelling moment, but it became more conventionally theatrical, right? Um, presentational rather than perhaps invested in an intimate moment of, of the eye contact as you looking up and seeing us and, yeah. So my, yeah, the first two shows, which were the Epstein Butcher and then we didn't come to hell for the croissants were done okay. with the traditional box. Then the third one, which was autobiographical, I took four frames and had them in one large box so that then you could really start animating with composite imagery, um, which was, yeah, that, I mean, that was like, uh, like, like <laughs> um, high order puppeteering of the box. It, it became very complicated and I think it was very effective. Then with the borrow but there were four performers on stage and each had their own box. And the boxes kind of um, had something to do with their character in their dimensions. Uh, the story was about the painters, Francis Bacon and Lucien Freud and their muses and what and how they kind of vampired quite literally the people uh, that, they, that they made work from. And again, mm -hmm. the box I think worked there because each character had their box. Um, and somehow you create a, a kind of, um, what's the word, sympathetic magic between the box and the performer. Uh, and there is, there's a very strange, and we use that in the borrow pit moments when other, when someone would touch your box, not their box. And those moments really have like a kind of frisson. Mm -hmm. Then in Cellist with Rabies, the box became digital to an extent. So we, uh, the, the illustrations were on slide film and we put the slide film under a microscope and the microscope projected onto a screen. And I think then we had stretched that thread too far oh. and, it's, and the magic oh. was gone. And you're right, the magic is the intimacy and the fact that the audience knows that you are you and not a character specifically. So even with the borrow pit, we were still breaking frame, talking directly to the audience, making eye contact. Um, and I love watching the audience, you, you know, they're because audiences are frightened often when you look directly at them. So you ease them in, you make eye contact. And then I love seeing the audience's eyes drift away from me into the box. And then what I really love is when little old ladies fall asleep, that they feel so, <laughs> they feel so at ease. They just, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god um i guess that's that's yeah that's very apropos of, of, of where i'm hoping to go next you very clearly have um a deeply grounded sense of humor you approach the world with that sense of levity and lightness and this form as well right um even with the most adult serious stories for what of a better one i mean even um you know Aikido on the carpet showed us now is has these kind of turns that you know um but there seems to be an undercurrent of levity irreverence not necessarily humor ha 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 humor although i tend to go there anyway um but there is this this very kind of light touch that that is always that seems to always be looking for the moment to lighten rather than to kind of create the sense of weight or heaviness um that suffuses all of the work even 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 chalice with rabies right when when that that thread snapped um yes you know, these these ways that that humor functioned as a kind of grounding device, if anything. Yeah. It's something you could retreat to. Well, chill us with rabies. The premise was that uh, and 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 our last performance was a week before lockdown, so it was a little strange, but it was it was a virologist who falls in love with the rabies virus and they have an affair. Um mm. which already is 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 quite a funny storyline, yeah. Yeah, that's, it's, a, it's a funny idea. But I think um, coming back to South Africa and starting my career, or, you know, in earnest as an adult after graduating, um, there was a very staid fashion of theatre making at the time. So you would go to the National Arts Festival and see almost the same play over and over and over again, which was very sober, um, 
they're, 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 they're tropes which which South Africans seem to be obsessed with, you know, and it's all the really hard stuff. It's incest and it's rape and it's um, murder and uh, and all of those are within the canon of theater, but I don't think you're going to get an audience to remember them if they come in and they feel like it's, a, you know, like a like a church sermon where they're being told, bah, 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 bah. Mm -hmm. much rather when you're creating the story, think what would I enjoy watching? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what would I take pleasure in watching? You mm -hmm. know, um, mm -hmm. and, and so then, people who might not ordinarily enjoy theater come to my shows and come again. Uh, and then yeah. I like to think that perhaps it's a kind of gateway drug to theater with a capital C, you know? <laughs> it's a perfect description. Um, you know, Which I love, I love theater with a capital T, but I've just never mm -hmm. managed to make it properly. And when I try, it still has that very clownish, like, <laughs> you know, like no one's quite like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think that there's something deeply important and, and political as well, right? About leaning into, into ple pleasure is a bit of a fluffy word here, but, but right, in leaning into these moments that allow us to invest in, yeah, moments of pleasure, moments of levity, of lightness, um, even if one is engaged with something that would otherwise be, you know, quite, quite, quite heavy otherwise. Um, it, it asks us, I think, to tack towards the issue from an unexpected angle. And for mm. that to be the humor kind of disarms one in some way, mm. is that you're laughing and, and the kind of critical thought that normally follows on follows at quite a distance rather than sitting right on top of my reading strategy because normally I'm sitting yeah. kind of decoding things and trying to understand you know what but there's 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 a way that the humor laughter breaking laughter it slows things down in some ways right it it it, it introduces speed bumps along the way um, between the moment of experience and the compulsion to intellectualize it as something of great importance. Well, and, and I think the intellectualizing uh, separates separates the audience and the and the performer, whereas humor uh, unites you. And once mm. and once the audience and the and the performer have entered into a, a friendly contract, you can go so mm. much further. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, and I and I always and and audience functions as as a unit unless there's like one outlier, but for the first five minutes of the show and Aikido is the first story in that particular show. So you start with something gentle, just to feel out who am I with? Mm. And then you go, okay, I can play with you guys. Or, okay, you guys are timid. Let's, let's take it slow. Um, or, okay, feisty, I'll fight you a little bit. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then I think an audience, yeah, well, I mean, it's like treating them like a human being <laughs> and going, yeah. come, who, yeah, who are you? Let's yeah. go, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then and then they can, and then once you've got them, you can tease them. And mm. I think that's good, you know? Mm. And take them, you know, so the, the final story in, in We Didn't Come to Hell for the Croissants is the most ridiculous, like, uh, polyamorous, uh, like I can't even, yeah, it's just an orgy of people and it's so ridiculous and and champagne goes flying out of the one guy's ass at the end and smashes against the wall while blood spurts out of this woman's throat as she orgasms and and by the time you've, <laughs> you've you know, befriended the audience, they'll go with you there. So you mm. go to the most conservative town full of farmers and they just lose their mind for that queer nonsense whereas <laughs> perhaps they wouldn't have if you'd come in and gone hey you this is me fuck mm. you mm, mm, <laughs> mm, mm, mm. yeah <laughs> there's 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 also it's kind of still on on audience right or, or spectators or, or i guess little kind of communities of people you play with um, there's such a broad range of people that I certainly have encountered when I've come to see these things. So, uh, you know, gateway drug for sure, because you have your kind of traditional theater goers, people who go to the theater anyway. But what I yeah, found I so... 
Pam and her theatre friend. <laughs> <laughs> Pam and her theatre friend. Yeah, so you have your Pam and her theatre friend. But then you also have this, I found a really unusual kind of unexpected young, um, generally non-theatre going crowd who you might perhaps see at, uh, you know, the standard comedy at the National Arts Festival. And then they're going to go see the bands and that sort of thing. There's a way that this work sits very comfortably within a kind of popular, for want of a better word, understanding of non-formal theatrical performance, um, yeah. but that also still kind of speaks in very explicit ways to the kind of, you know, Pam and her friend. <laughs> well, I think because having studied, studied theatre, um, then when you, or at least when I was studying theatre and I graduated in 2006, we were catering to Pam and her theatre friend. It was still quite a traditional, mm. Uh, mode of learning but I think that non-theatre makers make the best theatre because they don't have any of that stuff in mind there's you know so mm. I think I think artists and uh, dancers and uh, you know make better theatre than, than theatre makers <laughs> <laughs> but my point was yes I, I and, and so it took a while to be okay with being popular um, and, and certainly I've worked with collaborators who are like, oh, sold out, oh, mm. gross, you know? <laughs> I'm like, well, it's only a 20-seater theatre, so let's be realistic. <laughs> <laughs> but then also, to be and, then, and then I don't think of myself as an actor. I think of myself as a, as a performer, mm. as an entertainer, you know? So mm. then you can sit within that realm of, yeah, cabaret, comedy, uh, yeah cabaret comedy music and that's why I think it 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 works so well at festivals because people are there for the jaw you know they're mm. there to have a good time yeah and then you might you can kind of slip them the cyanide pill without them noticing mm. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> Jehan's asked um a question around uh lots of questions yeah, lots of questions. Jayan, you're just going to speak uh, because we're going to yeah. get there as well. Um, because one of my questions was going to be around, uh, you know, the kind of shifting formats, especially during COVID and how you've adjusted for that. Um, and we'll circle back to it. But I think it, I guess now is as good a time as any. Can my laptop? Yes, absolutely. Hi. <laughs> yeah, Jayan, off you go. Hi. Or do you need to read your question? Okay. No, absolutely fascinating stuff. I really thank you for that. And thank you for the show. I mean, my son was like, what's going on there? I want to see that. It's awesome. Uh, and I was like, furiously, furiously texting, furiously texting Mgeni on the side. It's like, is this age appropriate? Is it going to like reveal like, something? I else? think it is. I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, that story is. And then suddenly, as I, as I said, as I said, fuck, then your son. Yes, and I saw him in the background as well. I almost died. That's okay. He, he gets yeah. he gets ten he gets ten rupees every time he hears one of those words, so he's good. Oh, oh. fantastic! He <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Gemma will wire transfer it to me. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> no, I won't. I'm broke. <laughs> um, okay. No. So so really, like, I mean. I know Mgeni has been on this quest to understand intimacy in the digital space and how it transfers, mm -hmm. but it also comes to, it's it's looking at just the whole act of going online or, or have you performed online now? Because I just feel like you've got this format that would actually work so beautifully in this space. But I was quickly looking up the, the form itself. And of course it is about presence. It is about having that that sense of, you know, we, we call it Russ between the audience and the and the performer yeah. and so with this mask of this wooden television you also now have this very clear glass wall that is bulletproof in terms of making any connections so i just wanted to know yeah. how you ha have you played with that has it struggled with you but also if we are saying what you're doing is kind of a one proposition for the gateway drug into the practice of theater into the consumption of theater then suddenly I'm just like, well, you know, then digital access means you're not going to be selling out to an audience of 20. You're going to be selling out to an audience of 20,000 if you choose to. And have you just played with these two ideas? Because I just feel like if you're going to peddle this gateway drug, then let's just deliver it via Amazon instead of via cycle with some shady guy who's handing them to you in, in, in the dark. Yeah. Um, Jehan, 
You join a long, long line of people trying to get me to put this stuff online. And I was, I have refused to my own detriment. I have refused. Um, so before, yeah, even before lockdown, people were saying, have you filmed it? I've never filmed the works. Uh, and, then, and then when lockdown happened, the way that I started to peddle the drug was to do it in people's homes. So <laughs> I called it Gemma in the house and I would come and perform for like, I mean, I performed once just for two people. Uh, in their lounge. So you, sh you showed up to deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very bespoke. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Also, the the the, the last the, the the borrow pit part. Partly, what, what I wanted to do was because since two thousand and nine, I haven't watched Kamishibai. I've always just done Kamishibai, and I, I love watching it so much. So in the borrow pit, I got to have some time when the performers weren't performing. We would sit and watch. Um, and so I don't know what it it looks like through the digital wall. I have no idea. Uh, but I just I, I guess I remember the feeling of what it's like in person. And I get, I'm chasing that high to extend the metaphor. So you've you've remained okay. So if you've been remaining, I mean, if that's your take, then then have you looked at anything or have you witnessed anything online that has made you think, hold on. There is something here, and this is not to convince you. This is just to ask. Yeah, yeah. You. Um, and and in all honesty, I'm going to say no. I haven't looked that hard, but I think so. There was an explosion of stuff. I don't know if it was the same for you, but at, right at the beginning of uh, 2020, so March, April, May, everyone was working out how to go online, mm. and all the stuff that I saw, I found a massive turn off. Yeah, but. I didn't look very hard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's really interesting, right? Because I, I also had not ever experienced this through this kind of digital, you know, format. This is the first time I've ever mm. seen kind of it not in person. And I mm. must say, in Vanessa's note of this as well, Vanessa says, yes, I can see why you refuse. The intimacy and humor of it live would be really special. And Vanessa, it really is. Um, and I think, yeah, those, those, those two words, right, the intimacy especially, there is something about being physically in front of you that, that, that confers a different kind of texture to the work. I wonder whether it's because you recognize in the live encounter that, that it's dynamic, that it's improvisational to a certain extent, that you're kind of walking on a knife's edge the whole time, right? You're, you're sussing out the audience, you're sussing out the moments. Whereas this feels more like television, feels more close to me. I'm, I'm, I'm watching something that I'm not a part of. Um, yeah, so it was really curious and, and interesting to kind of experience it this way. But again, I have the prior experience of having seen it. So perhaps I'm the wrong test subject for the digital version anyway, because I've been tainted by my previous experience. Um, follow up question, Jehan, yeah, yeah. I mean, you spoke about again. I'm not trying to convert you, but you spoke about <laughs> uh, you spoke about the wooden. You spoke about what the wooden piece does as a mask, mm. and the possibilities that you've learned from it and how you've used it. And I also love the idea of like you take something really heavy and you 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 you, you give it you give it out in micro doses. Mm. Um, that's also uh, really amazing and and a lovely thing to think about rather than think through like a heavy Greek tragedy in order to achieve catharsis. It's like, here, take this painful, sharp, hard, really smarting, and then let that memory stay with you forever. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's great. But I mean, you talk about these dynamics, but then I just feel like, aren't these dynamics that could be explored, the, the, the positives of the mask that is a glass mask, the positives of a mask that is, um, that makes me feel, because this is the first time I've experienced Kamibashi. Is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, Kami Shiba. So Kami, Kami is Shiba. paper and Shiba is yeah. play. play. Yeah, so Kami, this is the first time I've experienced Kami Shiba. Uh, my son hung out and saw it. Um, you saw him seeing it. You saw him seeing it. Uh, you thought, holy fuck, he's just heard me say F as he sat down. So you had that moment. Yes, yes, I'm, yes, okay. Uh, and um, 
and so 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 there was something there it was real it's connected i'm feeling i'm feeling happy and connect, connected over here um mm. so i'm just I, wondering I, about i'm just I, wondering about those yeah, my perhaps is uh when when an audience is in a theater okay i'm going to i'm going to go back on so let me let me do the first thought when an audience is in a theater they're trapped <laughs> when when they are behind a screen they're not but if you think where kamishi by started which is on the street then the audience is not trapped either mm. yeah which makes the importance of being an entertainer instead of a actor that much more important mm. and another yeah, piece that i just love i'm just yeah i'm i mean i'm going to take that to the students say your job is to be performers and entertainers the acting just happens to be how you do it you know exactly. that is exactly what i think yeah yeah but so so then i i still put my question back on the table for you is just like there there seem to be like the same dynamics that you can explore here in it's 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 this it's a tool that offers the same dynamics it's like the a toothbrush and an electric toothbrush if you yeah and I, oh sorry keeping with the metaphor it's like a a a a rolly or a vape yeah <laughs> yeah no i i i think you're right and i and i do i i've always just been stubborn um but in lockdown one of my oldest friends who illustrates a lot of the 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 shows she started doing her drawing classes in online on zoom and I I thought it I thought it was a a lesser version of of a drawing class but I drew for 2 years and got so much better and she really got the format to work so it it was a tool that was successful yeah mm -hmm. I wonder if we can circle back to this this question of the mask right and and perhaps maybe <laughs> the the resistance you have Jenna might not be so much about the digital but is what the digital or how the digital shifts the quality of masking perhaps that that affords you as a performer mm -hmm. in the live moment as opposed to this one um I, I, i you know i kind of think of the top of my head but there's something about the proximity the physical contact this whole thing right we're not just seeing you we're seeing you as part of this frame um mm. and it feels quite safe in some ways right it's like a thank you whereas this is suddenly a different order of of visuality entirely um it's a different mm -hmm. kind of image where you are almost kind of contained and captured in the thing so it's interesting that you spoke about the audience being captured and not being able to move as opposed to being able to move i'm wondering what it means to think about that as a performer from the other side of that is the plasticity mm -hmm. that one has the flexibility one has in the safety of that format in space yeah. as opposed to this kind of well it makes me think also that the trapped would be a negative way of thinking about it mm, and the mm, positive mm. way would be thinking that you you are entering a liminal space or a space where you you know that something otherworldly can happen whereas mm. with with the, this i've i mean ever since skype days when i was in japan i would always find it very disturbing to say goodbye to to the you know my mother on the thing and then and then be here i haven't gone into another place and with mm. the online theater that i watched that was weird for me is that i um there's no there's no ritual that begins and ends the act of watching ah, so that transports us as an audience as spectators into the moment and out of again yeah when it's just mm. the way or it is the like that sense of transportation that's really really interesting um lights going down sitting you know the the whole thing i mean whatever it is in your particular going to the theater there is mm -hmm. something that you do before the show starts mm -hmm. and and with online 
you know, like, I mean, I've, I've done also, we all have done all these things online. So Pilates, like I, my Pilates was online and I can be like, okay, like, uh, okay, here I am. Hi. And that just, it, 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 or, 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 or therapy, online therapy, you know, you're just like, no, babe, just hang it, hang it over the, hi, Barbara. Mm. Sorry. Mm. It doesn't feel, um, Perhaps we need to develop, if, if we are going to be online for a lot of our lives now, we need to develop that ritual. Mm. What do we do before we enter the space? I was, yeah, I'm just thinking, I wonder, yeah, in, in some kind of strange, bizarre way, it seems to me that this kind of digital space, whether, you know, for performance, whatever it might be, <clears throat> seems very specific and very bounded out. But in some ways, it dissolves those boundaries, right? Is that frames disappear, even though this one is the thing. So to enter into a performance is to move from the frame of the ordinary and everyday into this kind of live framing of our encounter as an encounter that I will step out to out on at some point. And I'm 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 really taken by this this um, observation that you've made that that somehow this doesn't compel us to enact those kind of ritualized openings and enterings into the encounter because mm. there's no suspension of the, the everyday that's immediately outside of this frame i'm looking yeah. at you i'm talking <laughs> i'm looking at my garden i'm seeing my dog down here in a way that 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 i wouldn't otherwise mm. and there's you know like i think there isn't anyone on earth who has theater tickets booked and kind of 45 minutes before they have to leave the theater they think i don't really feel like going <laughs> do you know what I mean but then you do uh, mm. and you end up having a good time but it's the inconvenience which is part mm. of the ritual you have to go somewhere you have to mm. you know I'm sorry I'm not looking at the chat window at all are, are you keeping oh, tabs I, yep so when no. when you want to oh actually when before I ask you to to have a kiki with us um it is quarter to the hour so we can cease recording at this point because that part of the conversation is over. But 